Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. I really don't understand why you invited me here after I heard all of the speakers before, before me. And uh, the strange fact that I found myself as the only one who is wearing ties. <laughs> ah, there is another one. I approached by at least five of the, the people asked me for drinks. <laughs> because only the waiters <laughs> were in ties. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am the mayor of Tel Aviv. My name is Ron Khuldai. And I'll uh, try to give you a small presentation about my beloved city. So, good morning. I just landed from Tel Aviv, and I want to tell you about my city. And let's start with some numbers. Tel Aviv is the world's largest small city, only 52 square kilometers. It has 14 kilometers of beaches and 120 kilometers of bicycle routes. It has 220,000 trees, and every two hours we plant a new one. UNESCO declared us as a World Heritage Site thanks to 4,000 buildings in the Bauhaus international style. This style was born here in Germany and became part of our culture. By the way, another German culture influence we like very much is the Schlafstunde. <laughs> Only 400,000 people live in Tel Aviv City, but greater Tel Aviv includes at least half of the country. The city's population is extremely, extremely varied. We have the highest number of old people. At the same time, one of every three Tel Avivian is under the age of 35. By the way, the combination of old and new is a main part of our legacy. Even the name Tel Aviv means the past and the future. There are parts of the city that have been around for 5,000 years, and parts that are very modern. It is a city that celebrates pluralism and tolerance. We embrace everybody, Arabs and Jews, religious and seculars, Israeli and foreign, legal and illegal. We have one of the best nightlife scene in the world. 1,748 bars and clubs, one for every 200 residents. <laughs> By the way, last week we were elected another election, the best gay city for 2011. <laughs> this announcement made the people of Tel Aviv very happy. We are proud that everybody in Tel Aviv can be proud. <laughs> and most importantly, this city has something very creative in its DNA, which make it the perfect place for startups. Tel Aviv is a startup by itself. It was founded 100 years ago, when 66 families of entrepreneurs decided to build a city on empty sand dunes. They dreamed of a garden city in a place that there is no water. They dreamed or dreamed of a city of a future in the homeland of the past. In short, it was a classic startup. Big dreams, but small chances. Surprisingly, they succeeded. The founders of Tel Aviv had a vision and did not care about reality. They built national theater even before there was a nation. They built an art museum in the mayor's living room. They even decided to speak a strange language that had been dead for 2,000 years, Hebrew. So they built a school called the Herzliya Hebrew Gymnasium, named after the founder of our national movement, Theodor Herzl. Everyone in the school had to teach and study in Hebrew. And guess what? Soon, everyone in Tel Aviv and outside of Tel Aviv followed. The spirit of entrepreneurship became part of the city's legacy, and Tel Aviv quickly became country's financial center. Last week, 
we created over 25,000 new jobs. Tel Aviv is also the nation's cultural center. Over the past decade, we invested $400 million in 20 cultural institutions. Last month, we opened the new Tel Aviv Museum. Last week, we opened the new Cinematheque. And 20 hours ago, we opened the new National Theater. In a few moments, I'll get back to these projects. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I was not born in Tel Aviv, but rather on a kibbutz. My parents were also entrepreneurs, but they did not dream of making a lot of money. Their goal was to create an utopian society. They built a collective farm and were teachers. As a young man, I enlisted to the Israeli Air Force. I served for 26 years as a combat pilot and always dreamed of following the footsteps of my parents. When I retired as Brigadier General, I turned to the public education system and asked to be a teacher, but I did not have the qualification for being a teacher. So instead, they offered me to be the headmaster. <laughs> so guess which school needed a headmaster that's right, the Herzliya Hebrew Gymnasium. <laughs> that is how my love story with the city of Tel Aviv, Yafo, began. After a few years as a headmaster, I decided to run for a mayor. The city was on the verge of bankruptcy. And today, we are rated AAA stable by Standard & Poor's. We focused on management, on culture, on promoting creativity, and mainly, and this is the most important, on maintaining the city's value as the center of pluralism and tolerance. This is why the city is so significant. The project, the project I showed you before are not only impressive buildings. What happened inside and outside these buildings is the most important. For instance, the gay community center that we built is not only for the local community. It serves every young uh, teenager in Israel who has a question about his or her identity, identity. Last week, I received an email from a gay Arab who told me how much he loves Tel Aviv. This type of emails is not obvious in a region that we are coming from. Tel Aviv today creates culture. <laughs> Tel Aviv today creates culture. It sparks debate. It pushes you to think. Important political demonstrations take place in our main square. We have a major role in the Israeli democracy. And this is probably our main mission. The State of Israel has not yet decided what it wants to be. A nation of innovators and Nobel Prize winners or conservative and extreme society. In this debate, Tel Aviv plays a crucial part. Today, Tel Aviv is a technological center. We have over 600 startups, research and development centers, and international companies like Google and Converse and others. We are the startup city of the startup nation. How we are setting uh, ambitious goals? Now, we are setting an ambitious goal to be startup city for you. We have a perfect ecosystem for innovation and a perfect city for young innovators. In 10 years, we want to be sort of a Silicon Valley for countries outside of the United States. We will develop more working spaces, more hubs, more academic programs. We even brought the DLD conference to Tel Aviv. The first, yes. Thank you for bringing the DLD to Tel Aviv. <laughs> the first one took place two, two months ago, and the next one will be in October. Please take a piece of paper and a pen, because I'm going to share with you the most important thing you need to know when you come to the next conference. Take with you to Tel Aviv one pair of shorts for the beach, another pair of shorts for your business meetings, 
A laptop, don't worry about internet, we provide free wireless in the public space. Don't eat a week before you come, our restaurants are amazing. And don't pack your umbrellas. You need them here in Munich, but not in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Thank you very much. What? I mean, you've already heard the key part of the story, that every waitress, every taxi driver is doing startups in Israel. That's why you have to come to Israel. That's why Israel is a startup nation. That's, that's it in a nutshell. But if you want to know the metrics, you know, Israel has more startups in absolute terms than anywhere outside of Silicon Valley. If you look at all of Europe combined, we just heard that Tel Aviv has about 600 startups. Uh, it, all of Israel, we estimate about 4,000. Um, and about 500 new ones a year. All of Europe produces something like seven, 800 startups. So Israel, is, as the economist said, a high-tech superpower. And of course, uh, in venture capital, again, we had a piece in The Economist this week, uh, which pointed out that Israel has, receives a higher percentage, a higher per capita uh, amount of venture capital than any country in the world. Our figures are two and a half times the United States, about 30 times Europe on average. This and is the triumph of optimism over experience. Yes. And so what the book is about, really, is why Israel? Why did this happen in Israel and not some other place? We wanted to figure this out. And we realized very quickly that it was a matter of culture, it was a matter of history. And in fact, uh, I'm not going to tell you so much about, about what makes Israel a startup nation, not just because I want you to read the book, because, but because we are, we're, only have a few minutes, and I want to take this to the next level, but, because it is DLD. Uh, but I want to say one thing, that it is about adversity, it is about how Israel has overcome every kind of adversity, the fact that we're a small country, a tiny country, under attack, boycotts and so on, no resources until recently. Um, uh, and we've had to overcome this adversity with innovation. Uh, and in fact, what you see in the book is about how this innovation, how this adversity, how this, I would call it creative energy, went into startups. But you could write whole other books about how this creative energy has gone into social entrepreneurship, how it's gone into the arts and culture, what you're going to see when you come to Tel Aviv. Uh, it's amazing. The, the feeling of energy is amazing. Um, and so the question is why? What is it about Israel? And I'll just mention one factor of the many we get into the book, that not only is Tel Aviv a startup, but Israel is a startup. And this gets into something about the nature of innovation that I think is a lesson coming from Israel that's relevant to many countries. And that is that we have a misconception about innovation. If you put the word innovation into Google Images, you'll get lots of pictures of light bulbs. You can try it. Uh, what happens is we, we think of innovation as the idea. And the symbol of the idea is the light bulb, so that's innovation. But I think the story of Israel is that it's really not that Israelis have so many more ideas than anyone else. If you look around the world, you know, Israel is very strong in patent density, patents per capita. But so are a number of other countries are stronger than Israel, or as strong. And yet these other countries don't produce nearly as many startups as Israel. So you've got to ask, the light bulbs are going off, but they're not getting the startups. Why? And I think the lesson from Israel is that there are two other big ingredients, in addition to the idea, that seem to be in Israel. One is a lot of drive and determination. Some people call it chutzpah. Some keep, there's different words for it. Grit is a good word. And the other thing is a willingness to take risks. And if you don't have those two additional ingredients, the ideas are not going to turn into innovations, into startups, into companies, into products. So the real question is where Israel got those. And that's where the whole story comes in that I'm not going to get into. Because um, I want to talk about what this means going forward. And, and we could call it scaling up startup nation, but that gives the wrong impression because when people think of scaling up, they think, okay, where are the big companies? Why can't we build big companies? 
and this is actually something I, I agree completely with Yossi about, that you know, maybe we're gonna build more, maybe the next Facebook will come out of Israel. But what strikes me as I travel around the world speaking about the book, as it comes out in different languages, is how much everybody wants startups. I mean, well, Israelis are obsessing, why can't we build more big companies in Israel? You know, we call it Nokia envy. Israelis would say, where's our Nokia? Or they don't say that so much anymore, but uh, <laughs> they say, where's our Nokia? That was the symbol of the, the big tech company coming from a small country. Uh, but you know, when I went to the land of Nokia, to Finland, I asked them, what about Israel? They said, oh, you, you, know, you have so many more startups than we do. They're able to get 10 times as much average investment, and they're able to turn over more quickly, which he thought was a good thing. And so what you see, and, and you see Obama announcing Startup America, uh, Cameron announcing Startup Britain, Startup Chile, the, you know, this huge city coming outside of Moscow, Skolkova, uh, Singapore. You know, everywhere I go, they're throwing billions uh, at how to be more innovative, and, and the tendency is how do we do more startups? So I think the most important thing for Israel is to do more startups, and the big companies will come or they won't. Um, uh, and so this gets into kind of how do you scale up startup nation? And I think there are basically three ways. One is more of the existing ecosystem. We have an ecosystem that's the, basically the 300 or so uh, R&D centers in Israel, the biggest tech companies in the world, Intel, Microsoft, Google, so on. Now it looks like Apple's coming. Apple just announced they bought their first uh, Israeli company and they're probably going to open an R&D center, the first one outside of Cupertino. Um, and so what you're seeing is that these companies are doing what the head of General Electric said. You know, he was in Israel, Jeff Immel. Very simple message, he said, you guys are great at innovation, we're great at scaling up. Bring us your innovations and we'll scale them up. And that's basically the formula between big companies and startups that's become so, so successful for both sides in Israel. And then, but the question is, where is the rest of the world? Because 80% of this is in the US. Where are the European country, companies? Where are the Asian companies? It's, it's happening, but not on the scale of the US companies, and, and I don't know why. So there's a huge opportunity for scaling up there. The second form of scaling up. You know why? Why don't you say you don't know why? Because they don't have Jewish mothers, you know. <laughs> well, the, a lot of the American companies don't have Jewish mothers either, but they're in Israel too. Uh, but uh, another huge way for Israel to scale up that I'm very excited about is solving global problems. And this is, this is something crazy. The idea that a tiny country like Israel could tackle any global problem is a kind of a crazy idea. But we're doing this now. Um, in a couple months, I'm gonna be able to get a car, a 100% electric car, drive it anywhere I want in the country. Israel is gonna be the first country to get off of oil with the company called Better Place, founded by Shai Agassi, an Israeli. It's happening in Denmark at the same time. The next country is Australia. It's gonna show it's not just small countries, Big countries can do this. And this is a perfect example for me of how you can take a global problem, do, Shai Gassi calls Israel his beta country, basically a place to try out a solution that's scalable to the rest of the world. And I hope we do this in education, we reinvent education, because we have an education problem. Let's solve it for ourselves in a way that we can bring it to the world. The same with health, with the environment, with energy. Let's tackle global problems in a way that can scale. But, uh, and I just wanna run a short video by uh, uh, Tom Friedman. Can we run that video to get into the next little part? Now that's gonna work back toward education. What, what we argue in the book basically going forward is there, there really just gonna be two kind of countries in the world. Uh, HIEs and LIEs, high imagination enabling countries and low imagination enabling countries. De forget you know, developed and developing. Why is that? Because if I have the spark of an idea now, I can go to Delta in Taiwan, they'll design it. Skip over to Alibaba and Hangzhou, they'll give me a cheap Chinese manufacturer and make it. Jump over to Amazon.com, they'll do my fulfillment and delivery. Go to Craigslist and get an accountant. Freelancer.com will do my logo. <laughs> They're all commodities now. What isn't a commodity is this. And the countries actually that are thriving today, look at Israel. Yeah. Startup nation, 
we, we're not going to bail our way out of this crisis. We're not going to stimulate our way out of this crisis. We are only going to educate, ultimately, and imagine and invent our way out and of this crisis. And Congresswoman Waters, on the, on the topic of education, look inside the unemployment numbers, as we did, for August, and this is what you find. Um, if you have less than a high school the degree, you know, the unemployment you think, rate is uh, startup nation. It's about uh, you know tiny little companies. What does this have to do with the financial crisis with big big countries, big economies? Uh, but here you have saying basically there are basically only two kinds of economies in the world: the ones that are going to be innovative, the ones who aren't. And we, I think, Israel has an opportunity to become essentially the Silicon Valley of the rest of the world. And what do I mean by this? Israelis go to Silicon Valley, everybody goes to Silicon Valley to do startups, that's fine, but it's really, when you do that, it's about the American market. Uh, it's about the world, but through the American market. Meanwhile, there's a big world out there. There are emerging markets that are growing faster than the American market, they are, uh, and then they're encountering whole new leapfrogs in technology. And uh, this is about 10 seconds, we wanna run the second thing because I want to show you someone I met just now in Kenya. His name is Solomon. Yeah, be quick. This is my host, uh, Solomon. Hello. That's Solomon. Uh, this is a place, uh, a 20 minutes flight from Nairobi. Solomon um, has never been to Nairobi. He lives in Kenya. He lives in a village three hours walk from where we were. And he has a cell phone. He has no electricity. He has no uh, credit card, he has no bank account, but he has a cell phone, and when he has two SIM cards <laughs> that he showed me, one of them is for Safaricom, one's for another one, one's for cheaper phone calls, the other one, he can do mobile payments that I can't do in Israel and you can't do here in Germany, we can pay for anything he wants with his cell phone. And this shows that, you know, how countries can leapfrog in technology, and how the world, I think, we, we're very Western oriented. We're oriented towards Silicon Valley, towards Europe, towards developing markets, towards Facebook. But meanwhile, somebody's got to do startups for the rest of the world, for leapfrogging, using leapfrogging technology and solving really big problems in these countries. And I think Israel is the ideal place to do this uh, because what entrepreneurs really need is they need to come to a place where everybody, everybody the, the waitress, the taxi driver is doing startups. It's very empowering, validating. So I think this could be a future of Startup Nation. Thank you. Saul Singer, very, thank you very much.